I feel so wonderful this morning to be standing here again with the privilege of reading. It's been a long, long time. But this privilege is to share with you this morning, the scripture is from 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter and verses one through 10. I'd, I'd like to invite you to listen as if with your imagination you can see with your mind's eye and hear with your mind's ear that it, it's Paul who is speaking, Paul the scholar, the teacher, the writer, the lover and follower of Jesus Christ. Listen to what God has to say through Paul. He begins by sharing with us a message from God which says, God's point of view, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you. On a day of salvation, I've helped you. And then Paul goes on to teach, not only the Corinthians, but us. See, now, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. Paul says, we are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault can be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way how through great endurance in afflictions, in hardships, distresses, troubles, beatings, imprisonments, riots, and in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger. but also in purity, understanding, patience, kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love. In truthful speech, and in the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left hand, in honor, and dishonor, bad report, good report, genuine yet regarded as imposters, and yet are true as unknown and yet well known, dying and yet we live on. See, we are alive as punished and yet not killed, sorrowful, yet always, always rejoicing as poor, yet always making many, many rich having nothing and yet possessing everything, everything.
Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. It was indeed a pleasure to have you back up here reading Scripture. Our second lesson is from the Gospel of John in the ninth chapter. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I wash and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And he said, he is a prophet. Thanks and praise be to God for this word, for the guidance, inspiration, and strength that it brings to our living now and always. Amen. So, I was at the PCUSA General Assembly, um, the big Presbyterian love fest in St. Louis. Um, as a voting commissioner and you know if, you know, if you don't know how it's set up, you, you go and, 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 and the Saturday it begins, you're in the big plenary room and you elect the new moderators and uh, we, uh, we elected uh, our co-moderators once again, the second time we've ever done this, uh, uh, Ville Marie Oliveira and Cindy Coleman. Uh, Ville Marie is from Puerto Rico and, um, and then Cindy Coleman is from New England and they will be sharing their duties together. And uh, we heard a lot of Spanish from Ville Marie. She made sure that she spoke Spanish to the plenary because there's a lot of Hispanic people sitting out there uh, in our denomination. And, you know, last time I went, I was in my 40s. As, no, I've been to general... Uh, I've been there many, many times. But the last time I went as a voting commissioner, I was in my 40s. And all I can say is, I don't remember it being so tiring. Um... But I did see a lot of my seminary uh, 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 former classmates, and I do have to say, those people have gotten old. <laughs> but what I really don't remember, that I see more and more 
especially in these last few couple of General Assemblies, but I saw it more in this General Assembly than I've ever seen it in my life. I remember when I was going to General Assemblies in the 1990s, and you would look up on the stand of all the leadership in our denomination who were running things, white men older than me. And when you looked up in the stand this year, that was not the case. It was one of the most diverse scenes I have seen at a Presbyterian General Assembly. This church is changing for the better, folks. Everybody's getting a voice and everybody's buying in, and it's a powerful witness to the world. It was fantastic. People of color, people of differing ethnicities, people of different national backgrounds, people of different sexual orientation, millennials and younger. They all have a place in our national church. And it was very evident when you were at our General Assembly this year that people have a voice in this church who never had a voice before. And it's a powerful witness to the world, especially in a world where there are churches that will never allow that sort of a thing. It's taken Presbyterians a long time to get there, but we're there and we're moving ahead. It was powerful. This past week, and I couldn't go because I was stuck in a committee meeting, but this past week, our stated clerk, J. Herbert Nelson, uh, led over a thousand General Assembly attenders down the streets of St. Louis from the convention center to the city hall to address one problem that St. Louis has that I had never really heard of, but it's a problem all over the country. People of color in St. Louis who get arrested for minor misdemeanor crimes get put in jail routinely all the time. And then they're stuck there because they do not have, they do not have the resources to make cash bail. Cash bail may only be $1,000 or it may be up to $10,000. But even if they have committed the, the least of the misdemeanor crimes, people can go to jail and just sit in jail for a long time before they're able to go to their hearing and their trial because they don't have money to get out. At our General Assembly this year, we took an offering, came up with $50,000 plus in our offering in our first worship service. And that march was to take that money down to City Hall and give it to City Hall so that there was money to get people out on bail. It was a powerful, powerful moment. So there was a lot of diversity in our church and a growing diversity. And it's good to see. People have a place where they can be who God made them to be. But that's, that doesn't mean that it doesn't create conflict. Diversity does create conflict. People have different opinions. They think, they think about things entirely different ways. And so when you choose to be a diverse place, you also have to find a way to be patient with each other and to walk the journey because diversity creates conflict. And there was conflict at General Assembly. There always is. But I want to tell you the story, what I call the story of the two Bassams, because it involved the work that, I'm, that I do in the Presbyterian Church. Because you see, not only am I, was I a commissioner, I'm also the moderator of the Presbyterian Israel-Palestine Mission Network. And at times that has been controversial work that I've done. And there's a middle, there was a Middle East committee where people were considering uh, Middle East issues uh, like they do every time they meet. I wasn't in that committee. I was in, I was in another committee, so I, sometimes I had to be there and I had to run back and forth. And don't you know what? My room where I was meeting was on the far end of the convention center, and the other room was on the other far end. It, took, it literally took me like eight minutes to get across the convention center. I was running back and forth. But during the hearings in the Middle East committee, there was a Palestinian man who came to offer his point of view on a subject. And after he spoke, 
And it was, and, and I would say that the point of view that he was sharing was, was not, and I know this, was not the popular Palestinian view. It was, it was counter to that. And when he left the room, his name was Bassam. When he left the meeting room after he spoke, another Palestinian man by the name of Bassam accosted him in the hallway. And it was witnessed, and there were, they, were, they accosted each other in Arabic, and people were guessing what was being said, but the long and short is the story just, just grew and got wild. And I was down, I didn't even see it, I was down in my other committee room at the time, and um, it hit the General Assembly news the next morning, because they put out a paper every morning about what happened the day before. So it hit the General Assembly newspaper the next morning which these things happen. But what happened was one of the church officials who was interviewed said that the Bassam who had accosted the other Bassam had been there at the invitation of the mission network of which I am the moderator. And I had to go into sixth gear really fast because I did not know this man. No one on our steering committee knew this man, and I had to go talk to that official and then get it, uh, demand a retraction and a correction of the error from the General Assembly news, and now suddenly, although I wasn't there, and, but I represented this network, all of a sudden I was in trouble with people. Because when you have diversity, you have conflict, and then you got to work through it. And we did. I, I think eventually the, the, the paper actually came out the next day and corrected the problem. Um, and we went ahead. But there were other things going on, other conflicts. There was uh, the, the issue of fossil fuel divestment was up before the General Assembly, and that was, uh, that was asking the denomination to divest from its portfolio all stocks in fossil fuel companies, and this was a very strong, mostly young environmental group, although there was a lot of oldsters in that group too, who were lobbying for this. And although I wasn't, I was busy with my own stuff, I saw what was going on, and I know a lot of the people in that group, and I could see sometimes walking by, there was conflict there too. A lot of Presbyterians who didn't like what they were lobbying for. And so the conflict couldn't be avoided because we're always dealing with issues. One conflict begets another conflict. And somehow, in the midst of conflict because of our diversity, the General Assembly was able to steer through and our leadership was able to help us in worship understand ourselves even better, understand what it means to forgive each other, to ask forgiveness from each other, and to seek God's grace. And there were powerful moments that taught us how we steer through the conflict of the diversity we've chosen to live with. And that is the leading of the Spirit of God. So in today's scenario in the Gospel of John, we know the story well. Jesus makes a blind man see, puts the mud on his eyes, his eyes are opened. That's a miracle. How could you be upset with a miracle, right? Well, sure enough, there were people who were upset with a miracle. Blind man was made to see, and there were people out there, religious authorities, who decided they didn't like that at all. So, The arguments are going back and forth. People are saying, this man is from God. He healed somebody. And then someone else would shout back, no, he's not. He's a sinner. And then the healed man steps up and says, oh, he's a prophet. And the stories go on and on. And the Pharisees argue with the people. And they argue amongst themselves. And they're calling Jesus a sinner. And finally, they, when, it, when it's all heated and loud and, and there seems to be no answer, they turn to the man who'd just been healed to ask him his opinion. And that blind man who'd been healed looks up and says, I do not know 
whether or not he is a sinner. The one thing I know, I was blind, now I see. That, in the midst of conflict, is a powerful, powerful witness. When you've been touched, when you've been healed, when the grace of God has taken hold of your life and the conflict causes all the disagreement to fly around all around you, the best and only witness that you can make sometimes is to say to those who are fighting with each other, all I know is this. I was blind. I was broken. I was struggling. But now, I'm healed. You want to put conflict away for a minute? You want to put the argument away for a minute? Make that your witness. I told you that I saw a lot of diversity at General Assembly that I've never seen at this level ever before. And I, I also saw how hard it is to allow that diversity to exist and to be civil to each other and still realize we're going to disagree, but we've got to live together. We're God's people. You know, and I'm going to say this because I saw it play out in many scenarios. It is one thing in a church like ours to have people of color and different ethnicities or sexual orientations to be part of who we are for window dressing, to look good. It is another to seek to understand to understand who they are and not only have them there for window dressing, but listen to what they're saying to us and try to understand where they're coming from in the world, which is a different place. It's something else to allow ourselves to move out of our comfort zone. So in closing worship yesterday in the big hall, we were led by the first ordained Sudanese Presbyterian woman from Sudan, and she is now the pastor of first Arabic-speaking um, uh, Presbyterian church in the United States uh, in, in, in a particular town that she serves. And it was a celebration to have this Sudanese woman who speaks Arabic who is the first ordained Presbyterian Sudanese woman ever. But I'll be honest. She was preaching, and it was work listening to her preach. The accent, the language, the mannerisms, not my experience. And yet, she told, story, she told a story about her life in Sudan, the struggles that went on there, went on to tell the story. I mean, she struggled just to get a seminary education. She wanted to go to seminary. She couldn't find a Christian seminary that, where she could uh, learn how to take the ordination exams of the, of the Presbyterian Church in Arabic. And it was delayed for a number of years because she couldn't find a way to take the required exams in Arabic. Then she told the story about the church that she was serving in the city that she's in now and how that was a small church, but, but her church was part of that. Um, they, they shared the building, but then, that, then the small church that oversaw it, they um, kind of finally had to fold because they couldn't make it anymore. It was just a regular middle-class white church, but they could no longer make it. And now the Sudanese church is there, but the presbytery sold the church out from under them and they had nowhere to go. And, but they found an, another Presbyterian church came in and embraced them and made them part of their complex. And now they are continuing, their choir was singing in that worship, and it was powerful stuff. But she, well, she was telling the story, 
about her struggles from Sudan and then her struggles when she, they were in the United States and the Presbytery wasn't listening to them, that they wanted to have a place to be their own congregation and she was almost crying as she's telling this story. You're thinking, man, it's tough to be a diverse church when you got to make yourselves hear the experience of the other and then go that extra step of asking them, What can we do to make this work for you? So part of me during the preaching, when it was hard to understand, you had to dial in, I'm thinking, why are they closing the final worship of the General Assembly with someone who's so hard to understand? And then the other voice in my head said, that's precisely why she should be preaching the last service of General Assembly. See, if we are not working at understanding the diversity we call for, we are not diverse. So, Jesus heard the man that he healed was completely misunderstood and driven out. The authorities drove him out away from the place, and Jesus heard this. And healing might have just been good enough for Jesus. He healed him. He could see. What more do you need to do? But Jesus heard the man had been driven out by the religious authorities. And you know what he did? He went to him. Jesus went for the sake of understanding this man's experience. A man just healed of his blindness and yet still struggling with the fact that he's being rejected. And Jesus said this to him, I came to this world that those who cannot see may see. And those who think they see may be exposed as being blind. And right on cue, some Pharisees who heard him say, he's not talking about us, is he? Those Pharisees still did not understand. But Jesus tells us this. When we choose to be diverse, and then we strive to understand the other, we change the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us stand and say,